In January of this year, I read John Krakauer's Into Thin Air, which documents the tragedy on Mount Everest in May 1996. Krakauer happened to be part of a doomed expedition and recorded the disaster, wherein eight climbers died on the mountain over the span of 24 hours in excruciating detail. I realize now that seeking out mountaineering challenges in the wake of that reading is probably a strange reaction. But most of the book is not about the tragedy itself, but the context and lead up to it. A good chunk of Into Thin Air investigates why people become obsessed with mountain climbing. For many, including Krakauer, it's about achievement in a very pure and physical sense. You either get the summit, or you don't. That stark line between success and failure, and the terrible beauty of big, deadly mountains, has an allure that I cannot deny. I'm not going to pretend that this expedition was anything akin to the rigor or peril of something like Everest, but it was my first proper mountaineering expedition, and fraught with many of the same dangers one finds in any significant alpine endeavor. Nearly half of our party of 12 clients did not summit for one reason or another, though everyone returned to the trailhead safely. The Grand Teton summit rises to 13,775 feet above sea level. It is immediately recognizable from 50 or more miles away. The towering mountain looks down on both Idaho and Wyoming, and it stands next to its siblings on the central massif, the Middle Teton, Mount Owen, Tiwanot, and the South Teton. Together they form a mighty sight, emerging sharply from the rolling plains. I set out on this adventure with my dad and my flight instructor turned great friend Jason. In the days leading up to the climb, we camped out in Flat Creek and put together some delicious meals. The first guided day was prep. Our guide, Weeze, short for Weasel, a nickname earned in his younger years, literally showed us the ropes. I've climbed plenty, but it had been a while, and I struggled on a slippery 5-7. We recapped belay procedure and the shouted staccato demands like, slack, off belay. You're often separated from your climbing partner by a fair distance, so you have to be concise in what you yell. We also covered how to use trad, or traditional, protective equipment like cams and nuts, which you place into cracks and crevices in the mountain to act as anchor points if you fall. There's Dad down there. Beautiful. You're at an anchor, you're going to be standing on a ledge, you're going to have a lot of climbing and... We woke at 5.30 a.m. the next day and made maple bacon and eggs in the chilly morning air. We were next to an elk refuge, and we could hear them honking at each other during the night, which lent the whole place a really wild air. The drive to Lupine Meadows got the butterflies in my stomach going. The whole approach to the trailhead, you can see your objective, way up there buffeted by severe winds and caked with snow. It looks really unforgiving and mean. We met up with Weez at 8 a.m. in the Lupine Meadows parking area. He was already there in his beige truck suiting up. He handed us our food bags containing dinner and snacks for two days at high camp. We did a final gear check and set off. Kind of plateau with a and a steep north face, and there's a sharp pinnacle to the right of it. It's yeah. TP Pillar. So our camp tonight, you will be camping on the other side of that peak, looking. When you look back this way, it's just beautiful trapezoid of rock, the west face. I lined up behind Wee's on the ascent, and I started pelting him with questions about climbing in the Tetons. Along the way, we got on the topic of lightning. 
The Tetons are famous for unpredictable and extremely hazardous thunderstorms. In 2010, 16 were injured and one person died in a fast-forming storm that reared up on the peak of the Grand. All of a sudden, it's like... And I'm like, I could totally tell when the lightning was going to strike. So, I didn't even think. I just jumped into the air because of my last experience. I jumped into the air into a cannonball and it's like bang! And I, ooh, huge air blast in my chest. Oh my God. Didn't get struck, didn't feel any electricity. Yeah, not too. Because if you have an ice axe on your pack or something, People have heard those buzzing. Right. You know, and. Or, you know, there's been stories of people with their fillings in their mouth. Jeez. They can kind of feel some weird. <laughs> that would be creepy. Yeah. On a large switchback section a few miles into the trail, we saw an adolescent brown bear rooting around in the bushes. It had absolutely no interest in us or our fellow hikers, but freaked out tourists kept clapping their hands and blowing whistles. The bear just continued to munch on vegetation. It's a high camp. See the building in a second. Jason, how do you feel? Great. Yeah. I can't believe we just did that. Like we ascended that. We arrived at high camp after about six miles and 4,300 feet of elevation gain. Oh, sweet. How's it going? Good, how are you? Did you get yeah. some good footy up here? Oh, very, yeah, tons of good footy. For the boys. Yeah. For the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the exception of the guides, all of us were fairly hammered on arrival. That's our objective tomorrow. How do you feel, Dad? <laughs> Calorie depleted. Yeah. Right on. We're gonna have some nice meatballs and pasta and. Mm. The loungy chairs were a particularly welcome comfort. Oh yeah, these chairs are luxurious. The Jackson Hole Mountain Guide's high camp is Spartan. A smattering of mountain hardware expedition tents amongst a boulder field above the glacial moraine below. The main feature is the tan-colored weather port. Inside, a surprising array of cooking stoves, pots, steamers, and bins. One of the guides told me that they got most of it up here by schlepping. I had a hard time imagining the pain of lugging a full propane tank to camp. I realized then just how difficult guiding this mountain actually is. You do all the labor and unseen tasks so that clients can enjoy charcuterie at 11,000 feet. Paper. It'll open up, you'll have a mylar bag. Um, grab that little packet of toilet paper and handy wipe and secure that in your pocket. Totally calm now, but it can be just blowing like crazy. Anything like that, okay? No sloppy overlap. Right. So, and when you do this, don't just don't just pull down and try to crank that. You'll rip the seam. After a dinner of bison meatballs and pasta, we chatted with the other guests. It was a delightful and surprising discovery that they were all salt of the earth. They hailed from all over the place too. Less from Cincinnati, who already had a very impressive summit record under his belt. Bailey and Polly from Michigan and Nebraska, another couple from San Diego, and so forth. The sense of camaraderie was immediate. 
The guides briefed us that we'd be split into teams of one to two, and our starts would be staggered the next morning. For Dad, Jason, and I, our assigned wake-up time was 3 a.m., and the departure slated for 4.30 a.m. We were last out. Others had starts much earlier, and everyone in camp went to bed around 8.30 p.m. Since three dudes would have been a tight squeeze in the tent, I slept in what the guides call the A-frame, which is a cave formed by two boulders that smashed together probably hundreds of years ago. Over time, people had plugged up any holes with smaller rocks and pebbles. It was actually a very comfortable bivy, and I didn't suffer from the same overheating problems that the folks in the tents did. I was up at 2 a.m. with the voices and the sounds of guides preparing breakfast and coffee in the weather port, or hut, as they like to call it. Weeze told us not to congregate by the weather port before our assigned time, so I stared up at the stars and the gaps of the roof of the A-frame and took some footage of the cozy hut, illuminated orange against the night from within. At 3 a.m., we broke our fast in the hut with bagels, bacon, and microwave burritos and washed it all down with mug after mug of black coffee. Weeze informed us that he'd be taking Dad and Jason as a pair and that I would be buddied up with Nick, another of the guides. Three, he said, would just be too logistically complicated and slow to manage up on the peak. I understood this much better later. Nick, my guide, is probably a year or two older than me, but he has the stamina and physique of an Olympian. The day before, he soloed a 5-9 pitch below high camp, summited the middle Teton, and then climbed Disappointment Peak for fun. Now, he was up at 3 a.m. with us and ready to guide me up the Grand. At 4.30 a.m., Nick and I set out, descending into the moraine into the headwall below the lower saddle, which sits between the middle and Grand Tetons. I discovered that Nick had a pretty serious, no-bullshit demeanor, probably due to the added amount of hazard. The day before, the National Park Service distributed an urgent message to all would-be climbers advising against the ascent to the saddle, because a massive rockfall had wiped out the usual fixed line that people used to protect their climb up the headwall. The previous night, our guides found an alternate route straight up the middle of the wall, it was precarious, though, since there was so much loose rock. Nick and I hiked quickly to the headwall and stopped. We could see the headlamps of several teams ahead of us in the dark. It was strangely beautiful. We waited on the boulder field below for a long time, however. A big traffic jam had formed. Someone yelled frantically. A soccer ball-sized boulder flew off one of the ledges along the alternate route and thunked into the snow below. It gathered speed and rocketed like a missile some 50 yards to my left and slammed into the glacial ice far below. I heard a bit more commotion above, terse voices. Nick, frustrated, called up to the other guides on the wall to get moving. In alpinism, big delays are usually bad news. You don't want to give inclement weather a chance to develop. Finally, the route cleared and we began our ascent. After my guide led the rope up and began belaying me from above, I jammed his cam by accident as I tried to dislodge it. Climbing. Cam's pretty good and st stuck. I'll get it out, don't worry about it. Okay. Lower saddle. Here's our objective. I feel like an idiot about that cam. Oh well, I'm still learning trad equipment. Having just met Nick, I found this extremely embarrassing and I was sure he thought I was a total klutz. We got to the top of the saddle and one of the other guides approached Nick about the couple she was guiding. 
they were the ones who had kicked off several large rocks and didn't warn climbers below. Apparently, they weren't following instructions well, and they were climbing sloppily. She wanted to spin them, which means turn them around back to camp, and a heated argument ensued. The other guides backed her up. This pair could not be trusted higher on the peak, where the rock hazards and need to follow guide direction become even more severe. After a long and emotional discussion, the whole team turned back, all the way to the trailhead, and I never saw them again. Nick and I continued up the saddle onto the flanks of the Grand. Our pace slowed with the steep terrain. It's often a little wet and or icy rock through here. Okay. So if it looks wet, just try to avoid it. Sure thing. We arrived finally at the first pitch of the Pownall Gilkey route. It was first climbed in 1948 by Richard Pownall and Art Gilkey, who later died on an American expedition to K2. The first pitch is a traverse up slabby rock. You're roped in because it's extremely exposed, with hundreds and hundreds of feet of open air off the ledge. The second pitch is graded 5.8, but there are straps you can grab onto that make the whole thing easier. I did this with relish. Nice. Thank you. Just totally spaced my gloves. The third is a 5-6, a straightforward ascent, followed by a few more fourth class scrambles to the summit ridge. What, 13,000 or so now? Oh, yeah, we're good. Wow. Two or four. We'll soak up this last bit of sun. We're going back in it. Oh, yeah. In five hours and 18 minutes, we summited the Grand Teton along with another oh, team, well Pete done. and Bailey. Thank you. Thanks for getting me here. Pure momentary That's euphoria. Great. Uh, woo, woo. Ah! Oh, this is so awesome. Yeah. Oh, I've been looking at it for so long. It's just crazy to finally be here. But here's kind of my fellow compatriots. This guy's name is Nick as well. <laughs> he uh, he was kind of guiding me up. Jason and Dad um, are uh, on their way. Um, they were with a different guide because it was just a lot to put three people with one guide. We all high-fived and sat on the summit for about 10 or 15 minutes. The sweeping views and 360 degrees were stunning. You could get a good sense of where the glaciers thousands of years ago sat above Jackson and the surrounding plains, flattening the valley into a pancake. The wind was cold though, even through all of my layers. Our pace was such that, unfortunately, I was about an hour and a half in front of Dad and Jason's team. We had to move. Our descent took us down the west face of the Grand, and Nick set me up on a 120-foot rappel, which is partially free-hanging. Cool. I haven't actually rappelled that much in my climbing career, and so this was probably the singularly most scary moment of the trip. Unfortunately, my GoPro battery died before you can really see the exposure. The rest of our downclimb was largely uneventful, but hard. My knees were screaming in pain by the time we reached the saddle again, and my triceps and shoulders hurt from all of the pressing on the rocks and the steeper sections. At the saddle, we encountered a British man wearing a fluorescent yellow shirt. He was asking the best way to get down. Nick asked if he had a harness. 
Exum, another guide company, had by this point installed a new fixed line down the middle of the headwall, an easy rappel. The man said he didn't have a harness. Nick asked if he had an ice axe. Again, the man said no. Nick, exasperated, asked if the man knew how dangerous it was to be here in these conditions without any equipment, if he had seen the National Park Service report on the rockfall. The man said no. Nick shook his head. Just don't move until we're out of the way, okay? We don't want rocks coming down. You'll have to glissade down the area where the rock slide happened. Highly dangerous, but it's your only option. The man looked chastised and nervous. Go well. Nick and I rappelled down the headwall and marched quickly across the snow to the boulder field to get out of the way of any potential rock missiles. The British man slid on his butt down the dangerous section and arrived at the boulders safely. We continued back down the moraine and up into high camp by a path the guides call the back door. I plonked down onto one of the lounge chairs, utterly spent. Nick, the Olympian that he is, bid me farewell and continued back down to the trailhead. I demolished a cup of coffee and a huge plate of crackers, guacamole, and hummus. I practically dozed off in my chair while chatting with a few of the guides and Les, who was first team and finished ahead of me. Two hours went by before I finally saw my dad and Jason rappelling and then glissading down the snowfield below the headwall. They looked exhausted, so I went down the path and met them on the moraine to carry anything they wanted up the final stretch. We fist bumped and proceeded up the hill, not talking much. We all collapsed into chairs back at camp. I was feeling terrible that we didn't all get a picture together on the summit, but Dad and Jason brushed it off. I read somewhere, probably in a crack hour book, that mountains and summits are incredibly personal. I have no way to explain what happened other than I went into a kind of trance on the upper saddle. I forgot about my summit mission entirely, in fact, and the idea that I was climbing with other people at all. I had a sense of being intensely present, trying not to fall, trying not to fuck up the protection gear retrievals, trying not to rain rocks on my fellow climbers, gripping the rappel line so hard that my arms hurt and my skin was stretched painfully taut over my knuckle bones. The mood at camp was mixed that evening. Lots of revelry and fist bumping going around, but also some reservation among those who did not summit. I felt a kind of bone tired that I'm not sure I've ever experienced. It's the sort of fatigue that can only be cured by several nights of good sleep. I crawled back into the A-frame after eating the leftovers of two other teams' appetizers along with my dinner, pot roast and mashed potatoes. The next morning, after a fitful night of sleep in my cave, I awoke to the sunrise on the Nez Perce Peak, its top section illuminated orange. We congregated around the hut for a final time, gulping enormous amounts of black coffee, eating weird combinations of blueberry bagels smeared with cream cheese and stuffed with bacon. We bid farewell to our fellow climbers. I truly do hope to see many of them again. We began our descent. Okay. Just a fat marmot in the middle of the trail. Toward the Lupine Meadows trailhead, we noticed the crowd morph and change from climbers with big packs, ropes, helmets, and ice axes to heavier set day hikers seeking more modest destinations. We reached the cars and high fived. Nice. Getting a little footy for the closing. <laughs> and now looking at this, I'm glad I didn't look at this map when we left. Yeah. It's daunting. Hey, Dad, what do you think? Amazing. Yeah. Nice job. Days. Nice job. We took great there care of us. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. After packing up in the car and bidding farewell to Weez, Dad, Jason, and I settled into burgers and beers at Dornan's, right outside the park. We stared up at the peak of the Grand, still jagged, still foreboding. This experience was transformative. I feel stronger for it. Denali, here we come. <laughs>